G'day, everyone. Welcome back to Talking Leadership. Thank you for joining us again. And as always, I hope everyone is well. Again, thank you for supporting the podcast. And for, for those of you that are following us, you can do that on many different podcast platforms as well as YouTube. So by way of introduction, my guest today is currently the Adult Education Consultant Practice Manager for Karajo. Could I welcome to the podcast, Cleveland McGee. How are you, mate? Well, thanks, Eric. Um, good morning so far. Yeah, not too ready. bad. Not too bad. Well, thank you for joining me. Can you give me a sense of what drove you personally and then professionally to take on roles of leadership? Well, I think certainly probably stems from my younger days as a footy player, something I still do now, but certainly stems from there. I, I remember distinctly, I guess, my first leadership role was being captain of a rugby league side. Uh, and I learned a lot from that. So by being that captain and learning that it was not just about my performance, but it's about the whole team performance. It, it was one of my coaches, my predominant coach for most of my juniors, junior rugby league career before moving to Canberra from the Illawarra, that I guess I established this understanding that my performance is only as good as a team performance. I can perform, be the best player on the field, be the best player all year on the field, but also have to be the best player off the field too uh, for my team. And the other aspect of that was at the end of the year, whether we win the premiership or we don't, when it comes time for that award ceremony, not worrying about getting that award, even if I was the best player. And I distinctly remember that. And it was a clear picture uh, that was painted for me about leadership, that it's not not about me. It's about those around me, not about what I'm doing, but what am I doing to inspire or empower other people around me to get their best performance as well because my best performance and their and the rest of the team's worst performance we're not going to win a game i need my best performance as well as their best performance so that was that was probably where it began for me as well as watching you know someone like leonardo on teenage mutant ninja turtles as a kid and seeing his leadership qualities but i guess back then as a child not understanding what they actually were i then unpacked and i guess discovered and that Leadership for me stems a lot deeper. It stems from my history and my culture, uh, responsibility for me of, of ancestors, you know, went through pain and suffering, done these aspects of protection, supporting their own families to not become involved as, you know, part of the stolen generations or not become part of these statistics that we see today. For my family, for, you know, generations and generations, we were fortunate enough to not be impacted in that way impacted rather by the exemption policy uh, that was brought in. And so for me, my leadership responsibility now stems back to my ancestors. If I don't carry on this aspect of leadership for my for my people, my family, my culture, am I not doing injustice to my ancestors that went through that pain and suffering to protect us, to give us a better opportunity at life? You know, that's a bit of my outlook on it from where it is now. There's other parts along the way that have come into, I guess, this concept that I've formed around leadership, which is a big driver and a motivator for me each and every day, which is the power within is infinite. Um, I often talk about it on my on my LinkedIn profile. I'm sure you've probably seen that. But the aspect of that is that leadership starts with each and every one of us and it ends with each and every one of us. It's all a choice. Mate, I appreciate that. Uh, we could talk about that for the rest of the podcast, but I've got some other issues I'd like to bring up with you. But yeah, I think that your definition of leadership is a good one. And it, it uh, for what this is worth, it reflects what, what I think about leadership and that's of being a service to others. And if your leadership style is about other people, then I think it makes for a more more effective leader that that's my that's a personal view it's not something i've drawn from any research or any anywhere else other than to say i think with this podcast and with others other people i've spoken to yeah it's when you reference other people and doing for others i think it makes longer term for a better uh, leadership outcome but again that's just my view so mate you've been around and worked in different organizations and, and it sounds like you've got a very good grounding in what your personal belief of leadership is do you think that there is a difference if any between leadership and management in organizations and do you see a difference 100%, 100%. There's no ifs or buts about it. Leaders and managers, are, they're completely different things. And I think for me personally, in my view, in what I've seen um, and experienced with with leaders and managers in my life, whether that's on a sporting field, whether that's in a, in a workplace role, you know, whether it's a leader or a manager, whether it's in the community, leaders and managers, what separates the two is that egocentric value that people carry. The manager is that person that I want the title of the leader I want that title of I completed that project. I was responsible for pulling off that job or that success. I was the one who made that what it is. If we think about leadership, they don't have that egocentric value within their personality. They don't want that title, that, I guess, branding of they're the person that was successful. They want the branding of their team was successful or as a team, they were successful. They were part of that successful team. I often reflect, you know, 
just a, a personal connection for me, rugby league, the greatest of all time, Cameron Smith. Whether you love him or you hate him, he's the greatest of all time. People that hate him only hate him because of how good he was. They, don't hate, they have got no other reason to hate him. He was the best football player we'll see and have seen ever. But he wasn't someone that was worried about. He didn't want. He didn't care if it wasn't him scoring the try. If someone else scored the try and that meant they were going to win the game, he was happy. He didn't care about getting the Dally M or he didn't care about being the person who, you know, was getting man of the match every week. For him, it was about his best performance, but the best performance of his team so they could win. As long as they win, he's achieved his goals. Those other, you know, statistical records and, and the stats that we see that's incredible of his, you know, history and his, his time in rugby league, that, all, that, that comes later in life and that, that becomes his legacy. But he's not worried about building his legacy while he's playing. He's worried about being his best performance and inspiring his team to best, be their best performance so that way they can win. They can win the premierships and that other stuff will it'll come. I added this podcast question a little while ago and I think I'm onto something, but I again want to want to get your perspectives on this. Do you believe from your personal experience and not drawing on anyone else, but just for you, that the this thing of leadership can be a lonely road or is it as lonely as you make it? As lonely as you make it. Yeah. It's, it's certainly look, I've had times where it's a lonely, dark old place because at the end of the day, you're the person, you've got that responsibility. You know, for me, the responsibility is to people of the past, to my family, to, to continue to be a leader. Regardless of the situation, you've still got to turn up and it's on you. And I guess that stems back to my concept of the power within. You know, the, when we hit these lonely road times of leadership, who's there to inspire us? Who's there to empower us? We've got to find it within ourselves. So when we become comfortable in doing that, when we start to value what's within us and we act on that rather than acting on, you know, this fuel to the fire of what people expect or the limitations they want to put on you or their perception of, of what you are or what you should be and what you can be. And rather we look for that within ourselves, we channel our inner status it doesn't become lonely anymore. Certainly there's areas and people around around me, um, but around us as leaders or around people as leaders that you can channel to for guidance or support or aspects of, of leadership from them as well. I've got someone that, that's a leader within my life each and every day, supports me to continue to drive myself as a leader, but we've got to find that within ourselves first. It is certainly the lonely road of leadership is as lonely as you choose to make. Measuring success, what does that look like for you, mate? measuring success for me is probably what I'm doing and the mindsets I'm changing. A big factor of my aspect is the mindsets that I'm changing. Am I opening up mindsets? Am I changing mindsets? Uh, am I influencing mindsets to be a little bit more flexible? If I'm doing that, job achieved. If I'm not, then I've probably got to look back at myself and go, why aren't I changing mindsets or anymore? Why aren't I opening up mindsets to different thoughts and perceptions? If I'm not, why aren't I doing that? Uh, and a big part of that in the way in which I do it was asking people to reflect on themselves. In terms of measuring success, certainly, if we talk about the Western systems and structures, you know, it comes back to what are you, what are you actually achieving? What money are you bringing in? You know, what's the input, but also what's the output? If you're spending more money than what you're bringing in, well, are you really succeeding? No. Everyone's got different levels of way that they can measure their success from the concepts of, of Western society and structures of what's their actual, you know, KPIs at work or, or KPIs on a sporting field or what are they doing in the music industry, for example? You know, what are their views or what are their listeners? How, how many are they? What money is that bringing in for them? But to truly measure success, you can have all that stuff and still be sad, shitty, you know, confused or frustrated, whatever, and not feel fulfilled. So for a lot of that, it comes from well, what, what define or definition do you put on success measurements for yourself? Certainly, you've got these other ones that you've got to just naturally, we've got to do, you know, in the workplaces, naturally KPIs and, and goals and targets that I've got to meet. On the sporting field, naturally, there's things that I've got to try and achieve to play my role in supporting the team that I play for in us getting the win. They're the measures of success on the external. But as an individual person, as a leader, what are you doing to define how you're successful as a leader? And for me, it's mindset. Leader capabilities. What do you believe are the critical leader capabilities that you that you see are, are, are essential in, in the workplace and, and beyond? Talk about the three Cs. And I do it in a, a book that I'm writing at the moment. The three Cs is a massive part of leadership capabilities for me. Funny enough, capability starts with a C, Cleveland starts with a C, it's a pretty cool letter. But for me, the three Cs is that courage, first of all, that courage to come up with a new idea, a new way of doing things, but not just come up with it, but actually put your neck on the line and go, hey, let's try this or let's do this or let's implement this, let's put this to bring this to life. So the first one's courage. 
The second one is certainly having the confidence. So you can be courageous, but you've got to have the confidence to be able to back that shit up when people are firing questions at you. You know, if you're wanting people to buy into what you're talking about, you, for example, this new life changer, if you're wanting people to back that up or back you up to jump on your bus ride and hit that journey together, you know, the first follower realistically is a leader as well. And those that continue to follow suit all play a role in that being successful. So you've got to have confidence in what you're talking about or, or why that's going to be successful. Because if you don't have that confidence, it's going to be very hard for them to jump on board. And the last thing is the commitment. The commitment that even when people jump on board, you're going to be the hardest worker in the room to bring that shit to life. Um, that commitment that, you know, when the when office lights turn, up, turn off at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon... If there's shit that needs to be done to make that thing successful, you're there, you're the person there working on it. Or if there's people that are playing a role for you, for example, maybe it's a graphic designer. You're not just leaving that office at six o'clock while they continue to work on it. You're sitting there with them until they finish that and you're leaving the office together. You know, it's that commitment that's the difference between being that leader or that manager. Do you just want that title that you're the person who come up with this and bring it to life? Or are you happy to sit back and say your team was what brought this to life? Yeah, interesting. Uh, what, so just just as a tangent, but still part of the conversation, mate. What what in God's name drove you to, to want to draw, want to write a book? What drove you to this particular book? Eric, what drove you to starting a podcast? Wow. Okay. This, so for those listening, this is uh, always a uh, always throws me on when the guest asks me a question. Okay, it started for me wanting to get a better understanding of what leadership means for me, and then once I got over that hump, it's more. What do other people's experiences of leadership, what has that meant to them? Because I went into this thing, I have to say, with some very fixed views about what I thought leadership is and isn't. And as I've uh, as I've got my street education, I guess, by talking to people, it's a lot more nuanced. And the, the analogy that, um, that my uh, supervisor for the studies that I'm doing said to me is like leadership is like an onion you keep peeling layers and every layer is a little different and it's in that that I think I found the drive and the interest to keep doing what I'm doing because I, I don't think the conversation around this will necessarily end at any point it's more about sharing what you think works and doesn't work depending on in some instances depending on where you work and other instances depending on your your worldview and then thirdly your view of this beyond the world of work so yeah that that's what drove me that was my interest and and to be fair to be able to leave a bit of a legacy of this stuff there so people can get in and and look up a conversation I've had with someone not necessarily to get my view of what leadership is is to help develop your own does that make sense yeah certainly and just reflecting on that you know you talked about that legacy you dropped that word of legacy that stuff will come because you're doing it for a purpose you're doing it for a reason you know because it's something that matters matters to you matters to other people uh, and it matters to those that are sharing their stories also and their perspectives on leadership so you're doing it for a purpose and that legacy will come for me you know it's no different i'm doing it for a purpose for me writing a book it, it actually began with i started reading a book i was quite a small book it was written by lee child and it was his first of so the bloke who writes like the jack reacher book so he wrote this book and i read the first chapter and the first chapter was what made me choose to want to write a book and, and it talked about you know the aspects of, of people uh, i guess all this concept that i got not from him but reading it and he talked about you know people doing things first and then having people buy in and i was picking up on these things that are called now the three c's so i leave with a chapter about that um the three c's of leadership for me then it was well how do i do this in it's for a purpose i don't want the title so i'll write the book i'll, I'll publish the book but it won't be my name people that know me and know what i talk about and know my concept of leadership um they'll certainly know i wrote the book but in the beginning it won't be but for those who don't know me, the book won't have my branding on it. And I'm okay with that because for me, it's not about that. I don't want that title. I don't want that reward. The book itself is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of what drives me or my measure of success is changing mindsets, opening up mindsets. So my book's not written to be, it's not a factual thing of, you know, this is what's going to make you successful or this is what you need to do to have a better life. Or my book is based around personal reflection and self-reflection. Um, I want it to be the most self-reflecting book. If you pick up and read a book that's going to make you reflect on yourself, it's going to be my book. And as I said, it won't be branded with me. Sorry about the kids in the background. It won't be branded nah, mate, with that's my okay. It's okay. That's all right. But certainly... 
people that know me will know it stemmed from me. And there'll be books that will have my name later on in life. That's cool. In terms of, you know, that thought process will, the biggest leader in my life, someone who doesn't even know that they're a leader in it, in themselves is a person who I guess made me go, okay, I'm going to write it. So I went to this person and go, look, I want to write a book. I know I haven't written one before. Does that mean I'm not a writer? No, it doesn't. Because the first person who wrote a book, well, they weren't a writer before they wrote their book, their first book, you know, so for me, you've got to start somewhere, um, you know, for yourself, you weren't a podcaster or, you know, you wouldn't have called yourself a podcaster until you started the podcast. And then when you've started it, now you've got the experience and you're gaining traction and you're learning how to do things. And for me, it's the same for, for writing a book, you know, and that person just went, yeah, write it, go for it. You know, what's stopping you? What's, what's holding you back? You know, there's certainly been, or there would be people, if I spoke to more people, there'd be people that go, oh, but you're not a writer. Yeah, but was the first person who wrote a book a writer? They were after they wrote the book. Yeah, you you mentioned, I think I would add this to your list of capabilities. You do mention self-reflection and that's a skill I think a lot of people don't give a lot of time to as a as a key a key process to make you a more effective, just a more effective leader, but a, a better human being is to be able to stop and have a think about and really be introspective about what you're doing. And I don't think that comes naturally to everybody, mate. I really don't. I think some people do that well, and it, it sounds like you it's what you base um, who you are on. And that that's that's an amazing thing given given how young you are being in your in your mid twenties that you you're able to get to that point. But I've met a lot of leaders in my travels, mate, that in, introspection is not it's not one of their strong suits and maybe it should be. And and hopefully when this book comes out it, it gives people some time to to step back. And I, I think that's the other thing and I'll maybe get your perspectives on this. You have to make time to be introspective and look inwards. I think if you don't make that time, I don't think you can do it properly. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it's we've all got time. It's what we choose to do with that time. When we're waking up in the morning, you know, or we're waking up early, sitting on our phones, scrolling social media, or we wake up, waking up early and going, you know, what's three things I'm grateful for to have in my life this morning? Or, you know, there's people that will set aside some of their time in the morning for yoga or meditation. And that's great. That's that's personal development. Um, there's people that set aside time for reading books. There's people that set aside time for looking at the stock market and what's happened overnight. And it's all what we choose to do with it. And when we talk about self-reflection, well, it's just part of our emotional intelligence, you know, and unfortunately in, in the working world of, of our systems and our structures, we don't value emotional intelligence or EQ as much as what we value our IQ, so our intellectual intelligence. It, it, it's quite interesting that we don't because that can be a very significant difference in how successful you lead your team to be if you give more time for that personal development in yourself, uh, for that personal development as yourself as a leader. And self-reflection is just, uh, I guess, one con one part of that emotional intelligence or what we call self-awareness. But once again, people say that they're not or they, they talk about not being good at it, but do they give the time for it? Do they give themselves the opportunity to actually do it properly or do it effectively? So that's the question they've got to ask themselves. And it's once again, it's a choice. They don't have to ask themselves that question if they if they don't want to. If it's not important to them, fine, don't. But maybe consider what the what the differences in their life or their leadership might be if they chose to value that a little bit more, value that emotional intelligence a little bit more than what they do, or give themselves time to be a bit more self aware. And certainly, when you're self aware, it, it changes the way that you can work, work with people. Cleveland, nature versus nurture. Are leaders born or made? both i don't think you can have one without the other a because i believe that we are all born leaders but the nurture part we're all born leaders but only some of us actually actualize that so some of us become leaders because we choose to be or we choose to do things that make us leaders for some of us we, we don't or we, do, we don't do enough to i guess be then valued as a leader i, I think we're all leaders um, and there's a point within our lives that we naturally become leaders but we're given this choice to whether we sustain as a leader or, or we go away and we don't become a leader anymore. And that's personal for me. For me, being that dad is being a leader every day. You know, it's a leader to my children, my boys that I didn't have in my life. Or well, for a certain period of time, I, I somewhat had, but after that, I didn't, you know, and that's being a leader by showing them the right things to do, teaching them respectful ways, you know, teaching them that regardless of the challenges or the obstacles thrown in front of us, we've got to overcome them. We've got to find a way within ourselves to overcome them. A significant part for me is that respect for, for women. Um, I stem from pretty much a matriarchal family of strong, resilient Aboriginal women. A and then second to that is also, it was my mum that brought me into the world. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. For my boys, it's their mother that brought them into the world. Um, and not just should they be grateful of it, but showing them that I'm, I'm grateful of it too. Showing them that I'll continually support my 
partner, um, just as she will continue to support me also. And so it's a choice that we we can choose to be leaders each and every day, which then for me makes up makes me that dad rather than just a father. You know, I, I certainly wouldn't give my father that title of being a dad. For my mother, I'd certainly say she was my mum. And so for me, that's what I see. I, I see it's a, it's a lifelong leadership challenge, but it's also a lifelong leadership accomplishment, which makes it the greatest challenge in my life as a leader, but also the greatest accomplishment in my life as a leader too. So nature is we are all born leaders, but we also choose to either be or sustain as a leader or we don't. And, and to each and every level, you know, some of us just play that dad or mum role as a leader in our lives. Um, and that's as far as we choose to stem our aspect of leadership. For some of us, it goes a lot further. You know, it, it's, I guess, looking at just random aspects of leadership. I don't know if you've seen that crazy bloke who dances on the hill and the second guy comes and joins him, what they call the first follower. Yeah, That person is just as much as a leader as what the guy who had the courage, the commitment and the confidence to go and go out and start dancing by themselves. Um, if that bloke, that bloke follows him and that makes it not as uncomfortable or not as weird to be part of that dancing on the hill and then more start to follow. And then you all of a sudden you're that lone nut that's sitting there by yourself and not dancing with the rest of the group on the hill. So it just completely changed it. And that's what I mean. So there's aspects in our life where someone might be doing something and then someone gets on board with that leader and goes, yeah, hundred percent, I'm backing you because they've got the courage, the commitment and the confidence in it as well. And then everyone else starts to follow. It happens in workplace all the time. You know, we're in a, in a board meeting and we're talking about random shit. What are we going to do to change, you know, this challenge or overcome this challenge that's being presented to us? And someone goes, hey, look, I've got this weird idea. Let's do this. This is why we should do this. They've got that courage, confidence and commitment. And then someone else chooses to get on board and goes, hey, I like what that person's saying. I'm going to back that person. Let's do it. And then all of a sudden, everyone else starts to go, hey, well, hang on a second. He's backing them. So maybe it might be worthwhile. And then they're jumping on board too, you know. We're all born leaders, but it's when we choose to be or when we're presented with these situations, do we choose to be a leader? Yeah, excellent. Oh, it's an interesting way to look at it. I, I yeah, couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't agree more. Final question for you, Cleveland. Looking back on your leadership pathway, and, and this is always uh, here's the introspective sort of hindcasting question. What would you do different, or how would you advise a younger version of yourself about being a more effective leader? That's a really good question. When you started that question, I was thinking, well, I wouldn't wouldn't tell them to do anything different because then I wouldn't be the person I am. Although I would, because if I could tell them something, I could be the person I am now a lot earlier than what I guess I am at this point. So yeah, it, it's probably the aspect of putting my neck on the line earlier. There was certainly times that I did it, but only to an extent that I, that I was courageous enough and confident enough to do. Probably, yeah to put my neck on the line more a little bit earlier. Uh, and I think I would have made jumps to being the type of leader I am or, or at the age I am now, if I had that advice when I was younger, um, probably do that. I, I guess it probably stems to another thing that I'd probably tell myself is, is listen to other leaders, you know. I think about things that, you know, mum told me when I was growing up, my nan told me, other Aboriginal community people told me, just people that I worked with, you know, a bloke you had on on here, Sam Rafshorgi, you know, legend dude, quality leader. But some of that stuff, you know, we listen to and go, oh, yeah, that's cool. But then do we actually take it on board and, and do something with it? So for me, probably an aspect of that is, yeah, not just be this type of leader I am now that, you know, is filled with that courage, confidence and commitment earlier on. So putting my neck on the line bigger than what I did or greater than what I did when I was younger, but then also listening to, to what other leaders are saying too. Um, not, not that I, I guess I didn't listen to them, but I didn't actualize what they, what they were telling me or I didn't actualize things that they were saying, you know, and, and that's one big thing, thing for me when I look back on, you know, the, the easiest one to think of is school, you know, value and cherish your time at school, learn as much as you can. <sighs> I thought school was just a roller coaster ride that I could have fun with, you know, you go your ups and your downs, you throw your hands in the air and whatever. And now education, man, so important. You know, if you stop learning, you stop leading. The way I see it, like, you know, learning and education gives us power, gives us, you know, that confidence to back up what we're talking about. So, yeah, that's a crazy question. That's a crazy question. When you, like I said, when you first asked me, I went, nothing, because um, I wouldn't be who I am without it. But yeah, certainly there'd be a lot. It's the question that I think, I think it gives you an opportunity. And, and I've sort of posed that same thing to myself. What would I do different? I'm in a different 
career point and life point than yourself. Things that I've learned through trial and error and things I wish I could have gone back. And like you said, just taken a bloody chance or stuck my neck out or done something a little different. But some wiser people than myself have always said hindsight's always a beautiful thing because, you know, would have, could have, should have, it doesn't count anymore. You can only be what you are now. And it's more to get that that grey matter thinking about um, if you can pick parts of your past that, hey, if I'd done that different, you can bring that to the present and do those things that you're saying you wish you'd done before. So as a leader now, um, if sticking your neck out and, and making the difficult call was difficult when you were younger, then start doing that now. I think it's um, you can connect the past and the present very um, very easily, but it, it's, it's an easy thing to look back and go, oh, I could have done lots of things, but you didn't do it. And um, if, if you take your idea about being introspective that one step step further then asking yourself why didn't you do that is the bigger question than not asking it at all so saying well right these were the reasons why and if that's not an impediment to you anymore you can you can do lots of stuff in a career particularly in that leadership space so once you've got your book done and dusted and you've had some feedback we'd love to get you back on to, to talk about what that feedback has been for other people because well, i think if, like you said, if you're constantly learning as a leader is an important thing and that ongoing learning, I think you, you said that learning gives you that ability to navigate in the world a little bit better than if you didn't. Uh, and I, I could not agree more. Thanks again, mate. I, appreciate, I do appreciate your time. Not a problem. Love giving it. Love having conversations. Like I said, mate, you have some, some good questions that you know got me thinking too. So I uh, appreciate you. Hopefully, you know, if it's only one person in your audience that's, you know, listening to this and it changes their mindset, then, mate, I've succeeded. Brilliant. That, that's excellent, mate. So for those listening, I'll be speaking to Cleveland McGee. Thanks again for following Talking Leadership and I'll catch everyone on the next podcast.